name is Terry Brabant. I teach at Neuqua Valley High School in Naperville, Illinois. The class that I taught today was geometry, primarily 10th graders. The lesson was golden ratio. Awesome. Okay, cool. All right, so starting off with the questions, we want to understand the decisions you made in planning for this lesson and how it fits into the unit and year. First question, how does this lesson connect to and build on students' prior skills and knowledge? What was taught before this lesson and what will come after it? When I began to plan this unit on the golden ratio, I had to consider where we had been before. We have just come out of a section, brand new chapter on similarity. So they had been working for a, about two days on setting up proportions, understanding what a ratio was, how it was different than a proportion, what they need to do to check that their proportion is true, cross multiply. So they're coming out of that with their prior skill. They also have already finished algebra, so their algebra base is, is quite strong. Most of them are average to above average learners. So when I was planning this, I knew I could go ahead and do an extension to that lesson um, on just the golden ratio, which is a little bit different, but does incorporate the same skills. Okay. Discuss the sequence of the lessons that surround this one lesson. This is fitting into the entire chapter of similarity, so we're focusing on um, the common core structure for similarity right triangles and then eventually trig. So I need to make sure that the sequence follows from just basic algebra similarity, basic algebra proportions, how do that fit into the geometry, how does that fit into the geometry world shapes, and how can we tell if those shapes are similar. We transfer that today to just looking at rectangles or a long versus a short ratio to turn it into gold rectangle for ratios. Okay, great. Talk about the standards or cluster targeted in this lesson. What did you do to make the lesson reflect the full intent of the standard or cluster? The standard um, or cluster for the Common Core was, the, again, the high school geometry standard of similarity, ratio, and trigonometry based on the right triangle. Um, so what I needed to do for the lesson to focus on that content was again make sure that there was a clear understanding of proportion and how that matched to a shape and a figure and then how can we compare those figures to each other with proportions. We sometimes have to find out missing dimensions. That goes back to the algebra skill of understanding cross product property and proportions. What did you do to make the lesson reflect the full intent of the standard or cluster? That one I need to think on. Okay. To me, I'm going to tell you that that's going to be a similar answer as we had before. Okay, so let me kind of rethink that. What did I do to make the lesson reflect the full intent of the standard? Okay. Did we just answer that? Well, we kind of did in that question there. Do you want to just move on to the Yeah, that would be great because okay. I feel like I'll be repeating myself a little bit. Right. And that will happen with these. Um, which of the core action indicators do you think this lesson best exemplified, and how did you plan for this? There were two core action indicators that I was um, focusing on, core action two and core action three. One of the cores, core action two, focuses on Content, I'm gonna stop you. Okay. Time out. Yeah, no Sidebar! <laughs> I need to make sure I have correction two in front of me. Instructional practices, I believe, is what it is. And correction three is connection to the content. Opportunities for mastery. Connection to the content. Okay, I'm ready. <clears throat> Which of the core action indicators do you think this lesson best exemplified? And how did you plan for this? The two core actions that I was focusing on were core action two and core action three. Core action two is set up to employ practices, instructional practices, so that the students can master the content. And core action three is giving them opportunities to master that content. Um, I have done an awful lot previous to this lesson in my class starting day one to make sure that with core action three, if they have an opportunity to build on content, they need to trust each other in discussion. So we have done a lot with seating arrangements, lots of activities where they come to the board, they do a lot of discussion with each other, with me, we use the right vocabulary words. We've really built a sense of trust in that classroom so they don't feel very embarrassed or shy 
This class in particular, I have very many students who are very self-conscious, low self-esteem, feel very nervous about speaking. So for them to even turn to a neighbor and be brave enough to talk content mathematically um, is hard for them. So I needed to make sure I set up activities that would allow them to feel comfortable in just turning to a neighbor and talking math quietly. Um, you did see a few students come up bravely and talk at the board, and that's been a long working process. And that's Core Action 3 trying to develop the climate of the, um, the classroom culture climate in trusting each other in that scenario. Student engagement is crucial. Or going back to the shifts here. Okay. We are interested in how the shifts required by the CCSS are being incorporated into your classroom. Discuss how this lesson illustrates the shifts required by the CCSS. The Common Core state standards focus on three shifts in mathematics, and today I was trying to focus on the shifts of coherence and rigor. Coming into this lesson prior to it, majorly we focus on fluency, which is a part of the rigor shift that we're, um, we're um, trying to hit in mathematics. Because they need to be fluent and quick in their application of the algebra, we've done a lot of practice beforehand on working with setting up proportions doing the cross plane, doing it with efficiency, doing it with speed, understanding how to set up a ratio. So today when we came into this geometry lesson, that was pretty much standard. But today we changed a little bit and just did one ratio at a time. And that may have thrown them a bit, but they were brave enough to get in there and just use their tools and set up that ratio, do the quick division. That helps with rigor because the more opportunities I give them to do it again and again in different settings, not just book homework, but also in the classroom with a measurement tool, learning how to use that measurement tool accurately, gives them a different sense of um, mastery. And that is why I went to the lesson today, is to give them a different opportunity other than homework, other than working at the board, turning to a neighbor with a worksheet and a measurement tool, and doing it one more time to practice the same idea of ratios. That was my focus. How did you teach the content of this lesson prior to the CCSS? What is the same and what is different? How did I teach this lesson prior to Common Core? Um, easy answer, may not have taught this lesson at all. This is a lesson, I have taught this lesson before similar to it, but the reason it's different now is because we're being allowed with Common Core Standards to, over the course of a year, shorten the amount of topics that we cover kind of narrow our scope a bit, only focus on a few, and then in those few content areas, really dig deep in that discussion. This year, because of Common Core, allowing us to do that, I could actually pull this lesson back up into my pacing for the year and actually delve into this and discuss the golden ratio because it's one small part of proportions and ratios. And it's a special part. It's very specific to the golden ratio of phi, 1.618. Many teachers, prior to this year, including myself, have skipped this lesson entirely. We just don't have the time to fit it in. I am loving Common Core because I can fit this back in. It was a perfect fit. That is how I do things differently. The same, however, if you're in a district, which I was before, that allows you a little bit of flexibility in your planning so you can juggle your topics and decide which topic can I maybe pull and which can I add to. I was fortunate enough in another district to be able to do this off and on, but this year I was able to stop and really go a little bit farther than I have before. Student engagement is crucial to the work of the CCSS. We want to understand how you ensure that all students have the opportunity to productively engage in the work of a lesson. First question. How did the students handle this lesson? Did they understand the mathematics of the lesson? And how do you know? When we're focused on Common Core with student engagement, again, we have to make sure our classroom culture sets it up so that they feel brave enough to be engaged, if you will, not just watching the teacher at the front of the room working her magic. This has, has to be them working with the math, working with the materials, talking to each other. I believe today, because there were so many activities that I scaffolded in, um, not only smart board slide projection of watching lesson in structured form, but also a video that they could be intrigued by and engaged in, and then turning back to group work and applying what they just learned gave every type of learner a way to be engaged. Watching them in the activity measure 
and discover their own golden ratios in the room when they use their own eye, trying to retrain their eye to, do I see this beautiful rectangular phi shape coming up? Um, was amazing because I even had some people, you know, giving me bams and whoops. And to get that level of excitement in a math classroom is not always common. So this topic was a perfect fit for this. I think they handled, the students handled it very well because it was, they could relax a bit and realize it's something different than math. It's just not step one, step two, step three. It's applying what they see out there. I think they handled it very well. I think they were excited. Good. Explain how you differentiated in this lesson. Did all students have the opportunity to work on grade level content? If all students <coughs> did not have the opportunity, then explain why. I had to consider when I built this lesson, trying to stay focused on core action three, is do I differentiate for different levels of learning as well as personality in this lesson? As I said before, I have some very shy learners. So everything I do in every lesson, not just this one, I have to allow them an opportunity to still learn and speak their math out loud without being so self-conscious and intimidated by just the act of speaking that out and being embarrassed. So I have differentiated in one source by sitting them up in special groups. Um, the room is set up in groups of three, in pods of three. Every group of three is very carefully chosen. So not only do I consider maybe a special IEP need that places them in a certain part of the room, but I will place them with students where they can seek help with comfort. So every group has a high level learner, an average level learner, and an average to below average learner. Every group will also have a student who is brave in their speaking and a student who is quiet and reserved. What this does is the brave student, just because of the nature of who they are, feels very comfortable talking about mathematics, whether it's in front of the board in the classroom, whether it's raising their hand, or in their group, hey, let's chat. The quiet learner usually is the one who sits and watches, but still needs to process, still needs to do. And by putting them in those groups, they break down the walls of fear a little bit, and they can very comfortably, in a small group of three, be brave enough to talk it out. They don't feel like they have to jump up to the board and do that. This lesson was a perfect fit for that. All learners were able to shine where they, where they could on their own at the desk or move around the room if they felt the need to. That was one reason why I set this up. Another way I differentiated was the type of activities I provided. Um, I scaffolded in, again, I, for the structured learner. I needed to make sure that that left brainer had a worksheet in front of them that they could follow and stay comfortable with the pace of the lesson the audio or verbal learner, I needed to make sure I gave them opportunities to stand up and talk or watch a video and learn and process. So that's why I provided that video concept. The kinesthetic learner needs to move and do in order for it, the processing to, to work and for them to, to reach mastery. So that's why I had the activities of movement. Here's a tape measure, here's a protractor, let's, let's stand up, let's find something in the room, let's measure it, let's come back and let's talk about it. So all bases were covered for different types of learners. Um, I really don't feel like anyone was left out and just in case it was the shy one who's just too afraid to get involved because there's too much activity. But I think if you watch the students, even the shy ones, could quietly measure and be involved. So I was very happy with how that worked out. Which behaviors from Core Action 3 did the students best exemplify in this lesson? And what actions have you taken as a teacher to make that happen? Core Action 3, again, focuses on the culture of the classroom. Is the environment set so that the students can actively involve themselves in conversation and work um, in a trusting capacity. Going back to my classroom seating, that is why I do that, so they can do this. I think in this lesson today, one of the best things they did in the indicators was their persistence in their mathematics. They, they kept going, even though some of them weren't finding the golden ratio and it wasn't working out to 1.618. Rather than feeling like, oh no, I did this wrong, they were excited to look for more and so they persisted in their application rather than just stopping and saying, I'm doing this wrong. They got excited, they got up, they watched students move, they were able to like, okay, they're going somewhere else, I'm gonna go somewhere else. That excitement generated that persistence so they can keep applying, keep applying, keep applying, and then see the connections. I thought that worked out very well. Great instructors are continuously learning. 
We want to understand what you celebrated in this lesson and what you would improve upon. Reflecting on the lesson, what worked particularly well and what might you do differently? Looking back at how the lesson went, initially I was very pleased. This is a topic dear to my heart. It is the reason I teach mathematics. I originally was to teach English and in my senior year of college, I observed a math class because I had enough background in case I needed to teach it and realized they were teaching the golden rate ratio and immediately was inspired. Big aha moment. Oops, I'm in the wrong field. So I chose the field math because of this lesson, actually. Um, I was excited about the fact that they had the same aha moments. They were just as thrilled as I was that first time to recognize there is mathematics everywhere. And it, it is kind of thrilling. It's not always step by step. It's not always, here's your algorithm, let's work it out. It's not always, here's the new vocab word, can we use it properly? It is the thrill of, it is everywhere around you, can you just look for it? Um, I think the one thing that I'm excited about is that they saw that same thrill that I did. With that said, what would I do differently? I think I would pare down the activities and ask for less. Um, I believe the worksheet, while it provided enough differentiation for the quick, fast-paced mover, it was too much for the average to slow. They saw it, some of them I think saw it as overwhelming, that worksheet, were feeling bad because they couldn't finish it. Um, I had to shorten my timing just to make sure the activity could happen. So I think in retrospect, going through there, each activity would be smaller, shorter examples, movement time less, and I think we would have more students with an aha moment um, and grasping the mathematical concept rather than just the thrill. They would actually say, okay, I can try this here and work it out one more time. I think we would have been able to close with one more application lesson that was um, a closer fit to maybe their homework rather than just do one, do maybe two or three. So I would have shortened my activities. Okay, last question. Were there any surprises or unexpected student behaviors or reactions? Surprises to the lesson. I knew that they would be, they're very well behaved students. They're very excited about doing the right thing for me in class and for themselves. What excited me was I saw some walls break down with um, just self esteem, comfort, excitement in math. Usually there's, they spend so much time taking good notes, being good listeners, raising that hand doing what they're supposed to do as a good student. And today I saw those walls come down and they were actually relaxed. They were excited. They were using their math without really knowing they were using it. So my surprise was by, th there are three boys who are um, not, they're first into the United States. This whole experience of the American system is, is odd for them. They're very quiet and reserved. I put them together for that reason. So they're brave in their background experiences. To watch that group today, Shout out, BAM, was the most surprising for me, exciting, because they never have shown that level of enthusiasm. They're very reserved and personal, so that was very exciting for me to see that. That was a little bit of a surprise. I didn't expect that excitement from them. Very cool. Yeah, that oh, is cool. Yeah. You're done. Oh, uh, there it is. <laughs> you did an amazing job.